Thank you very much, Georgios. I'm Hussein al Hash Hassan from Akilio, and I will start by briefly talking about LP1s and highlight their main characteristics and objectives so that you can have a small background that can be very useful throughout this tutorial. LP1 stands for Low Power Wide Area Network, which is a family of emerging wireless technologies that aim at providing large coverage and serving a very large number of devices from different sectors or verticals, such as smart home, smart metering, smart agriculture, smart cities, and many others. These networks have several characteristics and requirements. So in addition to being long range and serving a large number of users, which are sometimes, by the way, deeply deployed, these networks have simple topologies that allow them to be easily scaled up and to be easily operated and managed. Indeed, information transferred throughout these networks should be secured and protected. Furthermore, these networks operate with low bandwidth and sometimes with band restrictions. This limits the payload sent on these networks and open the need for efficient compression mechanisms, as we will see in this tutorial. For LP1 devices, they should have low cost to ease large deployments and they should have low power consumption, especially when the devices are battery powered. This is extremely important, especially that changing the batteries of devices is not practical at all. So as you see, Design constraints are not very rela relaxed for LP1s. LP1s in general have similar architectures. In front of us is a generalized LP1 architecture. It consists of the devices, radio gateways, network gateway, authentication server, and application server. Different technologies may have different terminologies. For example, in devices, or th the things, such as sensors, actuators, meters, etc. They are named differently in each technology, such as in device and user equipment. The radio, gate the radio gateway, which is the end point of the constraint radio link, is known as gateway, evolved node B, or a base station. The network gateway or router is the inter interconnection node between the radio gateway and the internet, and is known as the network server, serving gateway, or service center. We also have the server responsible for authentication, and it is known as the joint server, home subscriber server, or registration authority, depending on the technology. At last, we have the application server, which is known as the network application in some technologies. Going to real technologies, two main design approaches are considered for LP1. The first approach is to adapt and leverage existing technologies, such as in the case of NB-IoT that uses a subset of LTE standard. The other approach is to develop a clean slate technology, such as LoRaWAN. It's very important to note that my objective here is not to compare between these technologies but rather to highlight their main characteristics. So all of the presented technologies aim at having low transmitted power to ensure a battery life of more than 10 years. The throughput of these technologies varies, but it is low as you see in front of you in comparison with broadband technologies. For example, LoRaWAN offers a few kilobits per second, while NB-IoT offers a few tens of kilobits per second. Similarly, all presented LP1 technologies have limitation in frame size. An important aspect is the type of spectrum used by a technology. While some LP1s use the unlicensed spectrum such as LoRaWAN, others use a licensed spectrum such as NB-IoT. Finally, downlink might not be available or can be very limited in some, P in some LP1s, while others provide normal bidirectional communication. To sum up, there exist many LP1 technologies with different characteristics but similar constraints. These constraints mandate specific protocols 
as will be explained next by Laurent. Thank you very much, Hussein, for this nice introduction. Now we are going to see quickly the protocol used on the internet and more specifically for IoT. And we will also describe some concepts for interoperability. As you know, most of the protocol used on the internet as defined by the ITS standardization group, and they can be stacked to form layers. The original model was designed 40 years ago for computers. The first protocol is at layer 3 and is IP. It offers a uniform vision of the network with a global addressing scheme for all computers around the globe. This way, the specificities of layer 2, such as Ethernet or Wi-Fi, are hidden. This integration between these two layers is very important since it guarantees the stability for the application and also the network evolution. For instance, Wi-Fi didn't exist when the IP protocol was designed. Currently, we are facing a transition from IPv4 to IPv6, since the initial addressing scheme of 32-bit is not enough for current addressing needs. The IETF defines a new version of the protocol called IPv6, which removes the constraint on addressing. But since most of the applications use the legacy version, the move to the newest one is very, very low. On top of IP, we have mostly the TCP protocol. It's a very important and complex protocol to manage packet losses and control the amount of information a node can send to avoid network congestion. UDP is a very simple and is only an interface between the application and the network. Applications are built on top of TCP or UDP, but the most important application is HTTP, which is used everywhere on the internet. Initially, it was used to browse pay web pages, but it is also used to, for computer-to-computer -computer communication. It is used to implement the REST paradigm. In this paradigm, the information is divided into resources. Each resource has its own identifier called URI. Some resources contain also URI, so this way it is possible to link a resource to another, forming the web. Finally, we have on top of HTTP some description language to structure the resource. For the web browsing, it is HTML. It has been extended to XML for computer-to-computer -computer communication. Another very popular language is JSON. As we said, this model targets computers with almost unlimited transmission capability. There is no strong limitation on the communication capacity and packet carries thousands of bytes of information. With the introduction of new layer 2, such as IEEE 802.15.4, which was the support of Zigbee, but also found in other constraint networks, such as metering application, it was not possible to use directly the IETF stack. So, a bit effort has been done to reduce the transmission needs. First, IPv4 was abandoned since there is no more address, and IPv6 has been chosen. But IPv6 either is quite large, the double of IPv4, which led to the introduction of a header compression mechanism called 6 lopan Georgios will present it soon. The use of UDP was preferred due to its simplicity and a new protocol called COAP for Constraint Application Protocol was defined. COAP didn't break the REST paradigm and is still based on resource identified through URI, guaranteeing a strong compatibility with HTTP through gateways. We can say that this stack for constraint devices target MTU of hundreds of bytes and throughput of hundreds of kilobits per second. These values are not compatible with LP1 characteristic that assigned shown before. The MTU is of tens of bytes and throughput is not that high. It was not possible to redefine a new protocol stack since it requires a lot of energy and time and the adoption is risky. So we prefer in the LP1 working group to generalize the compression mechanism defined by 6 lopan for IPv6 
and make it generic and applicable for any protocol it does. That's the origin of Chic, static context header compression. This way, and thanks to the fact that LP1 device traffic is highly predictable, we can compress the full stack in few bits, but remains compatible with the current architecture. We have seen the architecture in terms of protocol, but we can have also a look in terms of interoperability and the LSIM model help us to do it. The level zero of interoperability is when you are not connected to any other device. So you don't exchange information, which is not very interesting. Level one represents two hosts exchanging information. They need to understand how this information is structured the best example is an electronic card where a processor, query, and onboard sensor. The electronic card designer knows how to address a sensor and programs the processor to compute the information the sensor provides. Layer 2 is more or less the Internet. It allows any host on the network to communicate with another. Using a representation language, such as XML, or JSON, the receiver is able to understand if the binary sequence is an integer, a string, or a complex structure. Layer 3 adds the semantic, which means that the value can be enriched with information such as the unit, what is the relation with other data in the information system. At this point, we leave the pure networking capability and we focus more on how the information is manipulated into the information system if the model is static or can evolve with the information received. Our talk focuses on how to increase interoperability for LP1 system. Currently, as Yusen explained, we have a point-to-point -point relation between the device and the cloud. With Chic, any device will have an IP address and the information system will not have to apply some specific treatment for them. But before looking at Chic in details, Georgios will continue with an overview of compression mechanisms defined for the Internet. Thank you so much, Laurent, for providing such a good overview of the protocols that are developed for the Internet, as well as the ones that are designed for the Internet of Things. I will now proceed with the state of the art on header compression mechanisms. The compression mechanisms are not new concepts. Indeed, they are here since the beginning of the Internet. And actually, if we are using the Internet, it is thanks to these compression mechanisms. If we have a look at the history of compression at the ITF, you will observe that there are several compression mechanisms that have been defined. The first mechanism was developed in the beginning of 90s and it was designed by Van Jacobson and it was used for early adopters of the internet for modem and phone lines to connect to the internet from homes or from the offices. In fact, if we didn't have this technology, nobody could connect to the internet, while the internet will not exist as we know it today. Ten years later, Karsten Bormann came to propose a mechanism that is called ROC for robust header compression which today is used in cellular networks such as 4G to carry voice messages that come with compressed headers. Again, 10 years later, in 2010, a new compression mechanism was introduced for the low-power and lossy mesh networks, and it is widely used in the smart metering industrial networks. For instance, in France, we have the smart electric meters that use the Sixlopan technology. However, Sixlopan was not enough for LP1 networks. And this is why in 2020, 10 years later, the latest compression technology came, which is called Chic, which can be viewed as an improvement of Sixlopan. Chic targets to compress the IPv6, UDP, and co-op headers. It basically targets to the IoT protocol stack from the ATF. However, it is more generic than that since it can be applied to compress any protocol. 
In the following, I'm going to give you an overview of all the state-of-the-art compression technologies before Dominique will dive deeper to show how the compression mechanism of Chic works. I will now proceed with the uh, header compression that was proposed by Van Jacobson. We are coming back actually to the header compression of Van Jacobson. At that time, the goal was to connect the computer to the internet through telephone lines. So we have to interconnect actually two modems. And of course, the throughput was very limited. Indeed, if we look at the technology, we had at the layer 2 a protocol that was called PPP, which stands for point-to-point -point protocol. And it was carrying IPv4 frames and UDP or TCP on top. That was the way actually to connect to the internet. The problem was that IPv4 and TCP headers are quite large, and therefore the header compression was a necessity. So how it works? Here we have the architecture of PPP, where uh, an IPv4 packet are put into PPP framing and sent, to the, and sent on the modem. But there is another protocol that exists that negotiates the connection parameters and the protocol to authenticate the user. So what Van Jacobson did, he added in the negotiation part the possibility a header compression. And this uh, HC, the header compression, will be based on the context that will be shared by the both hands. Now, in the following, we are going to see the different compression operations modes that have been proposed by uh, Van Jacobson. So in the first case, uh, when there is a packet that arrives to a PPP point, and it has to be compressed. And if the packet is a UDP and IPv4, then there is no compression option. Therefore, the packet is sent in an uncompressed mode. Next, when a TCP packet that arrives to the PPP point, and it contains a scene or fin bit that represents a new or the end of a TCP connection. Then in this case, there is not compression either, and the packets are sent in an uncompressed mode to inform the other, the other end that a new connection is being established or an existing connection is closed. Next, there are two more modes uh, of compression, the efficient and non-efficient ones. More specifically, when the TCP connection is efficient, then the packet will be transmitted in a very compressed way, while when the TCP connection is not efficient, then the packets will be sent either without a compression or with a minimum compression efficiency. Here we have a compressed header format, and at the beginning of the compressed header, there's a bitmap from C, uh, I to W and U, and for example, when there is a U, then it indicates that there is an uh, urgent point after. Then when there is a W, it indicates that there is a delta window. Then uh, A is for delta ACK, S is for delta sequence, and P is for delta IPv4 IP. So this, so this bitmap uh, indicates what will be uh, the value or the delta to be sent after this bitmap. Next, we have the mandatory field of flow ID. It is a number that will be sent by uh, the compressor to the other hand to indicate in which flow it has to perform the compression. And another important field is the TCP checksum, which is sent to the other hand to allow the receiver, after doing the decompression, to compute the checksum from the decompression and compare it to the uncompressed checksum that has been sent. If the checksum is correct, it means that the compression was good. If the checksum differs, then it means that there is a transmission error. Finally, what is important to mention here is that the packets under the VJ compression mechanism are classified by flow before compression. And next, the delta is transmitted for the field evaluation, evolution, which means that if a compressed packet is lost, then the receiver will not be any more synchronized and thus it cannot continue the decompression of this subsequent packet. Therefore, such compression approach is not well suited for low power and loss networks such as the LP1. Finally, Van Jacobson defined a set of bits in the first uh, field, the bitmap, 
to avoid sending the deltas and thus to achieve very good compression efficiency. For example, if uh, S, W and U are set to 1, it indicates that this is a telnet traffic flow. So in that case, we have an incrementation of acknowledgement sequence number by the number of characters that have been sent. Next, uh, another example of bitmap is S, W, U and A, which indicates the, uh, a file transfer. Thus, for a file transfer, the sequence was increasing, but not the acknowledgement. The VJ compression mechanism does not work for UTP traffic. It does not work anymore with TCP protocol either, since it does not take into consideration the TCP options. While using the delta encoding is very challenging, since uh, if one delta is missing, um, the subsequent packet cannot be decompressed. Next, 10 years later, uh, Karsten Bormann came to propose a mechanism that is called ROC for robust header compression to enhance the previous one. ROC today is used in cellular networks such as 4G to carry voice messages that come uh, with compressed headers. We have two versions of ROC. ROC version 1 or V1 that is uh, very specific to certain protocols and ROC version 2 uh, that introduces a language to describe fields uh, in the headers in order to make the compression mechanism more generic. Here is a list of profiles that ROC version 1 uh, was able to compress and of course the most uh, interesting one was the profile 1 uh, that comes with RTP, UTP and IPv6 or IPv4 uh, for voice over LTE technology. So how it works? A node that runs a ROC compression mechanism, it classifies all the fields of a header into five categories. The first category is the inferred. Here we have the fields that can be inferred from lower layers, for example, the payload length. The second category is the static. In this category, we have the fields that never change, uh, for example, the IP version. The third category is the static def. In this category, we have the fields that do not change within a flow. For example, the flow label. The fourth category is the static known. In this category, we have the fields that come with well-known values. Finally, we have the category changing. And in this category, we have the fields the, uh, of which the values are expected to vary during the packet stream. For example, here we have a real-time transport protocol, or RTP, for delivering audio and video over IPv6 and UDP networks. We have the packet in which the fields have been identified and classified according to the field classification that was previously presented. And as it can be observed, the static def has the source and the destination address, as well as the source and destination ports numbers which means that this packet belongs to a flow. Then there are fields such as payload and data length that classified as inferred. Next, some fields such as uh, version and next hop are classified as static. And finally, we have fields such as UTP checksum or hop limit that are labeled as changing. Now, the core idea of ROC, which is a flow-oriented approach, is to create a new header by classifying the fields of the original packet into two parts. We have the static part where the values of the field do not change within a flow and the dynamic part where the values of the field change um, within the same flow. Now, regarding the compression mechanism, ROG comes with three levels of compression. In the beginning, we have the initialization phase and the regeneration which basically means resynchronization process. In this level, a node uh, sends the full message plus the context ID, which will indicate the flow. Then in the second level, we have the first order of compression, where the static part is removed and the only the dynamic part is sent. Finally, in the third level, we have the second order of compression, where the dynamic part is encoded using different algorithms 
in order to uh, further compress. For example, the delta or least significant bits or LSB techniques can be applied. Then ROC comes with three modes of operations. The first mode is the unidirectional, where the feedback uh, from the receiver is not expected, and in this case, the nodes follow the previously presented order. Meaning, first the full packet is sent plus the context ID, then only the dynamic part is sent, and then the second order of compression. However, after a certain period of time, the transmitter supposes that the receiver might lose the um, discronization and it starts again with the initialization phase and this is why it is called regeneration level. Then there are two modes, the optimistic and the reliable, and in these modes the receiver gives uh, feedbacks to the transmitter. Now in the optimistic mode the receiver sends only the negative FAC and this is why it is expected to have good link qualities for this mode of operation. While in the third and the last mode, which is called reliable mode, all messages are acknowledged in order to guarantee that the compression properly works. Now, ROC version 2 uses the same principle of ROC version 1, and contrary to ROC version 1, that comes with a well-defined protocol which was done rather manually, the ROG version 2 introduces a language that allows to define the headers and the compressed headers. Now, here I have an uh, operation example where we can see the size of the uh, headers of the packet uh, regarding the time. And as it can be observed, in the first mode of operation, the unidirectional or U mode, which means that the transmitter does not receive uh, any feedback from the receiver. And what happens is the following. The transmitter sends both the static and dynamic parts, as well as the context IDs. And this is why uh, we see that in the beginning the size is larger than even the uncompressed header, because the context ID has been added to the transmitter additionally. And this is the first level, so no compression at all, and where the full message and the context ID are transmitted. Then it can be observed the first order of compression where only the dynamic part is transmitted, and finally we have the second order of compression where only the delta is transmitted, and thus the total size of the header is very close to zero. Later, as can be observed here, we have another peak, since we are in unidirectional mode, thus the transmitter does not have any feedback from the receiver, and thus it proceeds with the regeneration phase in order to resynchronize with the receiver in case it was desynchronized, by sending the full message plus the context ID. Next, in the other two modes, the gray colored uh, boxes in the bottom indicates that there is a feedback or acknowledgement from the receivers, as you can see here, the gray colors. And indeed, during the reliable mode, as it can be observed, we have the uh, continuous gray colors, this one here, this one here. Since we have always ACK, while in the optimistic mode we have the periodic negative acknowledgement, these are the three blocks here. Now, once again, in the unidirectional mode there are no acknowledgements at all, and this is why we do not see any grey blocks in this part of the, of the figure. And here we can see the reason why the ROC technology cannot be employed in LP1. More specifically, the unidirectional uh, mode cannot be used in LP1. This is because the full header, so this part here, plus the context ID, is transmitted from time to time. So here is the second time, and this is the third time, and this is too costly for certain technologies. While on the other side, the reliable mode, we have too much of feedback, so this part here, and it is well known that the downlink traffic is very expensive in LP1 technologies. Next, before proceeding with the 6 one it is important to give a quick overview on IPv6 header format 
in order later the six slope and compression mechanism to be properly understood. Next, we are going to detail the IPv6 header format. So here we have the IPv6 header format, which consists of eight fields and of 40 bytes in total. In the following, we are going to analyze the IPv6 header format field by field. So the first field is the version, and it consists of four bits, and it represents the IP version number. For the IP version 6, the sequence of bits is the 0110. Next field is the traffic class, which consists of 8 bits. The bits of this field represent two values. The six most significant bits hold the differentiated services or diffserf field. So the diffserf is used by the networks for traffic management and classification and for providing quality of service. The default value 000000, 000, 000 corresponds to the classic service known as the best effort. The last two bits of the field are used for explicit congestion notification, or ECN, and it allows end-to-end -end notification of network congestion. Next, we have the flow label, which is a 20-bit field, and it is used as an identifier by a source node to label the IPv6 packets that belong to the same flow for example, voice over IP application or a TCP session to request special treatment by intermediate IPv6 nodes. The special flow label zero means the packet does not belong to any flow. The payload length field consists of 16 bits and it indicates the size of the payload in octet. Then we have next header field this 8-bit field identifies the next protocol header following the IPv6 header, in other words, the transport layer protocol. The 8-bit hop limit field replaces the time to leave field in IPv4. This field represents the maximum number of routers the IPv6 packet can pass through. This value is decremented by one at each forwarding node and the packet is discarded if it becomes zero. Next, we have the source address field, and it is the 128-bit address field of the original source of the IPv6 datagram. And the last field is the destination address, and it is a 128-bit address field of the destination or destinations if we have a multicast IPv6 address of the IPv6 datagram. Next, I proceed with the 6 Lopan adaptation layer overview. The 6 Lopan is an adaptation layer for transporting IPv6 packets over IEEE 802.15.4 links. Among the mechanisms that are defined in the 6 Lopan adaptation layer, today I will give you a quick overview of the compression mechanism. IEEE 802.15.4 has a very small maximum transmission unit, or MTU, of 127 bytes. Now, considering that IPv6 header is 40 bytes and UDP header is 8 bytes, while the IEEE 802.15.4 MAC header can be up to 25 bytes without security or 46 bytes when security is employed, then, as a result, there are either 54 bytes left for the payload when security is not considered, or 33 bytes when security is considered. However, IPv6 requires links to support an MTU of 1280 bytes. Thus, it is not possible to transmit an IPv6 packet over IEEE 802.15.4 technology as it is. Therefore, header and compression Therefore, header compression and link layer fragmentation and reassembly operations are required, and this is where 6 Lopan adaptation layer comes. I will proceed now with the 6 Lopan adaptation layer overview. 
Now, the main goal of six loop compression mechanism is to take the original IPv6 header, add to it few bits, which indicates how the original header is compressed. These additional bits that are added for the compressed header. Thus, the receiver of the compressed packet, by reading these fields of the compressed header, can decompress the original IPv6 packet. Six loop header compression follows a stateless approach. It means that all the information required to compress and to decompress the packet can be found inside the packet directly. Next, Sixlopan is flow independent, and it means that two packets belonging to the same flow might be compressed and decompressed in different ways, which means we do not need to maintain a state of the flow in which the packet belongs. Finally, Sixlopan is layer 2 independent, which means that its compression mechanism can be applied both to wired, such as powerline uh, communication or PLC technology, and to wireless, such as the IEEE 800.215.4 technology. The header compression principle is elementary. Any fit that can be uh, guessed by the destination endpoint is not sent. Indeed, some of the header fits can be elided for different reasons, as we will see here. Let's see the first case. The version field can be elided in all cases since only IPv6 is employed in IoT networks, and therefore the value of this field is always 6. The second case is the, the payload length, and this field can be elided as well, since it can be inferred from lower layers, for instance from the IEEE 802.15.4 header. The next fields that can be elided are the source and destination addresses. However, since this is more complicated than just removing them from the IPv6 header, we will see their compression functionality later. Finally, the rest of the fields, traffic class, flow label, next header, hop limit, can be compressed according to the mechanism that we will see now. The IP header compression encoding consists of two bytes, and it may be extended by another byte to support additional context en encoding. The methodology is very simple. Indeed, the idea is to have compressed header fields which match the fields in the original IPv6 header. In the figure here, the IP header compression encoding is illustrated. As it can be observed, first the dispatch is placed. Its value indicates the nature of the 6 lopan frame. For compressed IPv6 datagrams, the binary sequence is 0, 1, 1. In the following, we are going to see in detail the, uh, the fields of the compressed IPv6 header. The TF field handles the compression of the traffic class and flow label fields of the original IPv6 header. Considering that it is a 2-bit field, it means that there are four combinations of these two bits. The next header field refers to the next header of the original IPv6, and it indicates whether the next header field is not compressed or not. The hop limit field represents the hop limit and refers to the hop limit of the original IPv6 and there are four well-known values. For instance, 1, 1 represents the value 255, and the other two combinations are the, um, the values 64 and the value 1. Then we have a new uh, context uh, identifier field, which stands for uh, context identifier extension and it adds a context to allow 16 uh, source and destination prefixes by default. The SAC and DAC fields, which represents the source and destination address compression, and it indicates uh, uh, where we have whether we have uh, stateless or stateful compression based on the context-based uh, addresses. Then the sum and dump fields, which represents the source and destination address mode. And depending on the combination, we might have different byte sizes. It highly depends on whether the addresses are link-locker or global, actually. 
Finally, we have the field M, which stands for multicast compression, and it indicates whether the destination address is a multicast address or not. Next, I will present two examples on six slopan compression. The first example is on link local multicast address, while the second on global unicast address. Here on the left side, you see the original IPv6 link local multicast address, while on the right side, you have the compressed IPv6 header, which starts with the two bytes of uh, uh, IP uh, header compression encoding, and then with the non-compressed IPv6 header fields. While analyzing field by field the original IPv6 header and applying what can be elided or compressed and what must be carried in line, our results show that the 6 slopan compression mechanism has achieved to compress the 40 bytes of the original IPv6 header down to 5 bytes when it comes to link local multicast address. More specifically, we have 2 bytes for the compressed header and 3 bytes for the non-compressed IPv6 header fields that are carried in line after the IPv6 compressed header. In the case of global unicast, as it can be observed, the source and the destination IPv6 addresses cannot be compressed, and thus they must be carried in line, which makes in total of 32 bytes. Then there are 2 bytes from the compressed header and 1 byte for the next header field that is carried in line, making in total of 35 bytes. As a result, 6 slopan compression mechanism is not efficient when global IPv6 addresses are employed while considering the small size of the common contexts among the nodes. Furthermore, we should not forget that in order to have an efficient compression scheme in 6 slopan, then the interface ID must be derived from the MAC addresses. I will proceed now to the summary of the state-of-the-art header compression mechanisms. It is important to note that if we classify the protocols, we can observe that we actually have two family of technologies. The first two technologies follow flow-oriented compression approach, which means that when a node receiving a packet, it first identifies the flow in which it belongs, and then it applies the compression. The other two ones, the six slopan and chic, are rather packet-oriented or flow-independent, since the compression is applied per packet and not per flow. Thus, two packets belonging to the same flow might be compressed and decompressed in different ways. Which means, we do not need to maintain a state of the flow in which the packet belongs. Indeed, all the information required to compress and to decompress a packet can be found inside the packet directly. Thus, Sixlopan and Chic offer rather more flexibility than the other two ones. Furthermore, Chic is a generic technology since it can be applied to other protocols in addition to IPv6, UDP, and CoAP. I will give now the floor to Dominique to present the compression mechanism protocol of Chic. Hello, and thank you, Georgios, for the background on compression and fragmentation at the AETF. I'm going to talk about the architecture of a shake enabled system and get into more details on the compression mechanism. So here are the fundamentals uh, that were underlying our development of shake. Uh, we assume the IoT device is rarely reconfigured or its application is rarely reprogrammed. Uh, it does the same thing uh, all over again for years. Um, we assume that the most uh, constraint that we're facing is the cost of transmission uh, over the air. And that cost reflects in terms of energy on the battery life or uh, on time on air um, on the radio medium. Uh, we assume that we have much more computation available than we have transmission. Typically, we can execute 
thousands of uh, CPU cycles for the energy cost of just sending one bit over the air. And we also assume that the uh, link is point to point, um, which is typical of LP1 technologies, which have star topologies, and therefore there's no out of order delivery that we have to deal with. Um, what we have designed, the, the principle of Schick, uh, support, of course, bidirectional links, but we were also sensitive to links where there's an asymmetry between the two directions, either in monetary cost or duty cycle allowance on the radio. And we even uh, support unidirectional links if need be. Uh, we're also sensitive to the fact that uh, the MTU, the, the payload size uh, allowed on a LP1 link, may be constant or may be variable. The network may be changing the allowed MTU size uh, under the user, and we have to deal with that. And finally, as I'm going to show you, uh, Shake provides extreme head of compression. We are not aligning to bytes. If only a few bits are needed, then we just use a few bits to send the needed information. Um, Shake also provides uh, very good fragmentation that Georgios is going to describe after me. And um, this is um, done with a toolbox of various elements and various profiles that you can pick from depending on your link layer. Um, fragmentation is all uh, optional if your link already has fragmentation or if you don't have MTU constraints then you don't need to use it and there's no costs associated with that. And as I'm going to show you, Shake in general, both fragmentation and uh, compression is very adaptable, very flexible. Again, it's more like a toolbox than you, you can build stuff out of. And we strive to uh, generate very little control dialogue. Um, so the, the landscape uh, around Shake is the following. Uh, we have two RFCs published, 8724 and 8824 that describe the um, technology. Um, the first one is very much a generic toolbox, as I said, and, and has an example of how to use that over uh, UDP and IPv6 for compression. Uh, 8824 um, adds a few elements to the toolbox and shows how to use them together with the main uh, shake technology to compress co-op, including its uh, secured version of score that I'm going to describe later, over UDP over IPv6. And then we have um, the description of how uh, we adapt to various link layers, and 9011 describes how Shake is used over LoRaWAN, and there are more coming. Uh, Shake over Sixfox, Shake over NBIoT should be out pretty soon. Uh, we also have a ongoing work on a data model for Sheik, uh, describing in a formal way how we um, describe the, the context, the parameters that are used for compression and fragmentation and make sure uh, a given um, instance of that context conforms to the data model. So here's a basic architecture of Sheik. Um, you have a datagram coming in at the center side uh, to be transmitted over the constraint link to a receiver. And each of the sender and receiver on either side of the constraint link are equipped with a Shake instance. Those two instances share a context, uh, which manifests itself under the form of a rule store. Shake is rule based. We're going to see what that means. This is somewhat similar to what ROC does. Um, so the incoming datagram here is going to be compressed by finding, uh, picking a rule from the rule store that applies to that packet. 
um, when it's compressed, it can either be sent over the constraint link directly if it fits the, the payload that's allowed at that link at that time, and then decompressed on the other side, or if it's too big to fit on the link, it will go to the fragmenter, which will also find a rule to describe how to fragment it, what uh, protocol to use for that packet over that link at that time. Um, you can see that the compression is unidirectional. We are not using any feedback path. The context that's here, the rules used for compression, do not change over the exchange of mes messages over the link. And that's why we call it a static context. Um, by contrast, the fragmentation may make use of a feedback path uh, for reliability. Uh, and depending on which flavor of fragmentation you use, you might use this link more or less, or not at all, if you don't have a feedback path. Um, the context, as I said, needs to be provisioned on either side of the link, and those two need to be identical for the whole system to work. And so how this is provisioned uh, could be different ways, either pre-provisioned into the device in the core as the device is commissioned in the field, or uh, later down the road over the air, a, ma a device management protocol could install or update that context if needed. Um, each of the check message that goes over the constraint link bears the number of the rule that generated that message, be it a compressed message or a compressed and fragmented message. Uh, the first bits that we'll show on the wire are the identifier of the rule, thereby the receiver uh, can um, pick up that rule from the rule store and be able to rebuild the packet, be it reassembly or decompression. And uh, the compression and fragmentation rules reside in the same store and the identifier share the same space. We're going to see a bit more in a moment. So how does that work? We're going to focus on compression mostly and then I leave it to George or later on to des describe the fragmentation part. So let's focus on compression and what's the idea behind that? How can we do extreme header compression in a lossless fashion. We are. Um, so on this uh, traffic capture of an IoT device, um, you can see bytes, many bytes. Uh, this is IPv6, UDP, co-op, and payload. Uh, each, each line is a new message sent by the IoT device, if it were to send it uncompressed. And one can immediately notice is that many of these fields are repeated. Uh, they either never change or they alternate between a few values. So obviously this traffic is very predictable. So if we have that knowledge, and, and there's, there's a reason for it to be predictable. If we have that knowledge, capture that knowledge in a context, in the root set, then it's easy to exploit that knowledge and only uh, convey uh, the information that is needed for each packet. And that's exactly what, what we are doing with Schick Compression. We're trying to um, avoid sending whatever is already known and only send the new information. So here's a very a simplistic animation just to give you a flavor of what's going on and then we're going to elaborate uh, based on that. So here's an incoming packet. We have uh, headers with uh, bits of ones and zeros and we know a little bit about the, the traffic coming from this device. So we have a priori knowledge on that header and then there's a payload and we consider we don't know what's going to uh, be in that payload, so it's opaque to shake. Now we're comparing the incoming packet with a pattern that we're expecting. And uh, so this is pattern number one, and actually we notice that this one doesn't match the packet that the device is trying to send at this moment. 
So we are picking another one from the store and this one doesn't match either. And then picking a third one and yes, this one matches. Um, all the bits, corresponding bits match and here we have a few wildcards, so they are don't cares. So we have a, a match. So what we are doing is picking that rule uh, pattern identifier and that's going to be the first bit that we send on the wire and then pick the extra information that is needed to fully describe the incoming packet. Tag the payload along that we've not looked into and that's what we send on the wire. On the receive side, as I said, we pick the rule identifier that uh, allows us to retrieve the pattern. Then we fill in the blanks with the extra bits of information, which we call the compression residue, and tag the payload along, and that's our reconstructed packet. So here's a slightly more elaborate example. Uh, in the case of uh, Shake, we're not going to operate just on a string of bits, as I just showed, but we're going to operate on fields. Um, so to the right, you show, uh, you see another example with an incoming packet in blue and green. That's UDP and IPv6. And here's our payload, which is maybe another protocol, but that we don't want to delve into. And that's our more elaborate pattern. So now we see fields, uh, which are the little boxes, and we see values, which are, you know, the, the pattern that we are trying to match. Um, so the matching uh, may be a little bit more elaborate than in our simple animation. We may have a exact match, which is uh, the pink uh, color. Um, and it might be a match to a list, which is illustrated with the yellow color. In this case, we have not one target value, but two or three. And um, we may have another matching, which is not shown on the example here, which is the MSB, the most significant bits do match. Uh, so only a partial match on the high order bits. Um, and so what we, uh, some of the fields might just be ignored and that the black box is in the pattern. So let's assume that this pattern number five, the rule number five matches the incoming packet here. So what we're going to do is, because this is known, this is an exact match, all the pink are exact matches. We don't need to send anything. It's enough to send the rule number to uh, be able to rebuild the values. And here the yellow uh, parts need a little bit of extra information to convey the full value. Here we're talking uh, prefixes. Uh, so because this list is of two elements, we only send, need to send one bit here to pick between the two options. And here, because we have a list of three, we are sending two bits to pick one among three. And that's our compressed packet, the rule number. In this case, the, the one plus two extra bits and the payload. So to be more specific, uh, currently Shik defines four matching operators. Uh, as I said, Shik is extensible. We might define more operators if we see a need for a given protocol in the future. But right now we're living with those four. Uh, equality, strict equality, uh, totally ignored. So don't care. Uh, mapping within a list of values and mapping on the most significant bits of the field. And that's now why it's a rule and not just a pattern. And then we also explicitly describe what the action is for compressing and decompressing that field. Uh, most likely, if the field was matched with an equal operator, we want to not send anything because as I said, the rule number is enough to retrieve the value. Uh, most likely if the field was ignored, we want to send it verbatim on over the wire, but we might also be able to recompute that from extra knowledge that we have at the receiver. For example, the length field can often be reconstructed from the length of the payload that was received from layer two. And so uh, we might just ignore the length field in the uh, incoming packet for transmission and be able to uh, 
uh, rebuild the length at the receiver with extra knowledge. Um, if we have uh, the list, then we are sending the index. I already mentioned that, and obviously, if we match the field with an MSB operator, then we may want to send the LSB bits. Um, so that's uh, all good, but now we have a little uh, more complication coming up, which is uh, fields which are variable length. UDP and IPv6 uh, have fixed size fields, so the the example I just showed looks like a stencil, a pattern that you apply on a packet bit by bit, and you are able to decide if there is a match or not. But if one of the fields is, uh, or several fields are variable length, then it's not quite a, a stencil that you can apply on the on the incoming packet. Uh, as an example, if field two is variable length, then uh, it, we don't quite know if those bits here apply to field three or to field four, depending on the length of field two. If we, if we just apply the stencil, and so. Um, we would have to have many multiple rules to describe all these situations, and that's a bit complicated. So we need to do something better. And what we do actually is break the pattern into fields, uh, both in the rule. So it's not long, uh, no longer just a linear string of bits. It's actually fields that individually have patterns, and we also break the incoming packet into separate fields itemized so that we can easily match each field in the incoming packet with that same field in the pattern. And of course we have matching operators that uh, take care of uh, fields that are variable length. So from the basic architecture I showed you before with a compressor here, we are moving to a slightly more elaborate architecture with a protocol analyzer that breaks the incoming packet into a list of fields and a rule matcher that actually operates between lists of fields, the list coming from breaking down the incoming packet into a field and the list of fields that are described in the rule that we are considering for compression. So this is all good. We have uh, dealt with variable and fields. Uh, now we have a little more complication coming up, which is a field that may occur multiple times, such as in co-op. And here's a Wireshark capture of that, but I'm going to uh, describe co-op a little bit later. Um, and so now we may have the same field that occurs multiple times. And so when we break the incoming packet into fields, we are going to not only describe what each field is, but also uh, which occurrence number this particular value uh, came up with uh, in the incoming packet. And same goes with the rule. We're going to describe uh, which pattern uh, applies to which occurrence of the expected uh, packet. So now we have everything to look at the rule description. And so, uh, again, we have a rule store with many rule candidates for compression, and each rule looks like this. It's, you can see it as a table with uh, rows that uh, pertain to each expected field and columns that describe the details about this expected field. So we first have a field identifier. What is it? What is this field? Uh, by a unique name. Um, then um, we have uh, its length, is it fixed size, and then it's uh, defined by the protocol, like a UDP checksum, we know its size, or is it something variable, and do we want to match something that is any length, or do we want to match only uh, something that is uh, has a length known a priori? Uh, the position, that's uh, the case of multiple occurrences I've already described. We have here a direction field, and this is um, a new idea uh, in this presentation, that we want to be able to share a rule between packets flowing in 
both directions. So we have an IoT device sending messages up to a server and server sending messages down to the IoT device. And um, those messages uh, going flying back and forth probably share a lot of elements in common. And so we wanted to be able to reuse that same rule for both directions. However, there might be little variations uh, between the packets going up and the packets going down. So we are going to express those uh, very, very variations with the uh, field direction. Um, and I'm going to show an example that may come clearer later on. Um, we also have the target value. I've already talked about that is a scalar or list and the matching operator, which I've already gone through. And now the, the algorithm is that if the incoming packet, after being broken into fields, has the exact same list of fields, including position, direction, uh, then the uh, rule that we're looking at in the root store and each of these fields matches to with the target value using the prescribed matching operator, then we have a rule that can be used to compress that packet. And if we do have a rule that can be used to compress that packet, then we may uh, look at the uh, compression and decompression action and apply that rule to do the actual compression. And I've already mentioned uh, what those compression and decompression actions are. So the rule is a fairly complex uh, structure, as you may guess now. And so it's important to have a formal description. And that's what we're doing in the draft um, to propose a young model that formally describes the, the rule set. Um, I'm going to show later on an example with co-op. Uh, so here's a presentation of the co-op header as defined uh, by RFC 7252. So just to go quickly over that, um, we have a version number of co-op. Currently, we're expecting the value 1. We have a type uh, uh, of message, confirmable, non-confirmable, acknowledgement, and reset, four values. Uh, we have a code, so if it's a request, what kind of request is that? Get, put, post, delete, etc. Um, we have a message ID um, that allows to match uh, an acknowledgement uh, to a request, for example. And here we have a token, so that's uh, a bit different. Um, the token first may be uh, multiple different sizes, and the actual size is uh, described with the token length field here. can be zero, in which case we don't have a token. But if it's non-zero, then we have this token, and the token is used to match a uh, content that is sent back later uh, after the request in an act. So we can have an act come immediately from the server back to the device saying, yes, I got your request, but I'm unable to provide the answer right now. So I'm first acknowledging your message and the actual content, the actual data will come back later. And therefore, we need the token to be able to match that deferred uh, response to the request. Then we have what uh, Quap calls options, uh, which are many different kind of information that you might want to send and payload, uh, if any. And if you do have payload, then you have this uh, option delimiter here uh, that separates options and payloads. Um, so here's, let's go through the co-op UDP IPv6 compression example. I've put laid down here the, the fields of everything with a little zoom on the co-op header. Um, and because we're expecting a message uh, that carries those protocols, then we, st we start laying down a rule with all the fields that we need for this uh, encapsulated uh, free protocols. Now let's add a little bit more details on that. And here I'm assuming that we're expecting, we want to match a packet that has a URI path 
um, which describes the uh, resource that the um, co-op message is trying to address and uh, that this uh, message also uses queries to modify the request. So for example, here we're expecting three uh, URI paths uh, and we will have three field descriptors matching occurrence number one, occurrence number two, and occurrence number three. And we have, we're have we expecting two queries and we have fields to match those two. So for example, um, a co-op request carrying that kind of URI uh, will match because we have three URI paths, one, two, three, and we have two queries. Um, this one will match as potentially match, um, and those two we know right from here that they won't match because this one only has two URI paths and this one only has one query. So now let's look at the direction field I already mentioned a little bit. So uh, in this example, uh, most of the fields are going to be processed uh, independently of the direction of the packet. Um, they are indicated by the bidirectional direction indicator. And because we're expecting a slightly different code and um, of the co-op message, we have an up and down here and I've replicated that code field to get ready to process things slightly differently in both directions. And again, in, in this situation, I'm expecting the IoT device to send a GET request up uh, to the server. And so the URI path and query are going to be present in the message going up and the content is going to be present in the message going down. Um, here I'm adding the length information. So those URI paths are essentially variable fields, but here I'm deciding that I only want to match the messages that have the second URI path that is three characters long. So it will match this one and only match um, the Quote messages that have the second query that is four characters long. So this one will match, but this one will not. Okay, adding more. Uh, I'm now adding the full columns target value matching operators and CD action. Uh, things no longer fit into one slide, so I'm going to scroll between alternate between the two slides uh, to see the full table. But uh, here you can recognize the matching operators I've, I've already mentioned, uh, either ignoring or uh, strict equality and the actions that go with them. Uh, and here we have a list of two potential prefix values, one link lo local and one global uh, prefix. Um, here we have a uh, matching on the MSPs of a, a USB, um, sorry, UDP port, and we are sending the LSBs on the wire. And that's the rest of that rule description. Uh, here I already mentioned we're expecting two different codes, uh, get going up, a content acknowledgement going down. So this rule will match either of those two packets. Um, and then the queries might use the MSB operators and LSB CD action. Uh, so we don't need to send the beginning of that string that we have matched uh, at the compressor and only send the uh, extra little bit of information that goes after the equal sign in that string. So let's step back and talk again a little bit about the uh, chic rule IDs. We often get asked, um, how big is the rule? Is it one byte, is it two bytes? Uh, well, actually 8724 doesn't say anything about the rule size. Uh, we leave it open to um, the profiling, to the use of any kind of situation. Uh, we could even have uh, a rule ID that's variable size as shown on the right. Uh, and we could use that to do entropic coding, assign the shorter codes to the rules that we expect to be used uh, most frequently. 
uh, here I've also shown that compression and fragmentation rules share the same rule space. Um, again, um, the compression uh, goes only one direction, so a rule ID is only valid in one direction. Uh, unless you decide to use it in both directions using the direction indicators, but the compression rule only reserves that number for packets going into one direction. Um, the same rule can be, as I said, can be reused for the other direction as well. However, for fragmentation, because we have, we may have returned traffic here between the reassembler and fragmenter, the rule number can only apply to data packet going one direction because we need that same number to describe the ARC. Therefore, if we have traffic going to both directions, we will need two rule numbers even if the operation fragmentation reassembly is identical in both directions. And uh, again, compression sits on top of fragmentation. Chic provides both. Fragmentation is optional. Uh, you have the upper layer here that is the header of which is going to be compressed and the lower layers on which you'll send the fragmented uh, chunks. And here's how this, the things look uh, after you've compressed your header. You have the rule ID and compression residue and payload. And if that fits onto the constraint link, you send it directly. If not, you break it into little pieces and prepend a fragmentation header consisting of rule ID and extra header fields again. And George is going to explain that in details later on. Um, so the thing is, Shake uh, operates on a flattened hierarchy of header, as I've shown in the example. So co-op UDP IPv6, we look at all the headers together to decide if the rule matches or not, then we wipe all of that and replace it by the shake uh, header. And then we send it over the link uh, by prepending the uh, link header and trailer. Uh, and the fact is that we most often want security in our uh, protocols, and so that's for confidentiality, and therefore we have encryption, and therefore the Whatever is above the encryption uh, barrier, encryption point is no, no longer visible for Sheik to look at the structure and fields and values. The situation is like this. For example, if you use DTLS, all of a sudden the whole Sheik header and data is obscured by encryption. And therefore, when you encapsulate with UDP IPv6, now Sheik uh, cannot look at the co-op header anymore. We can only compress what is visible. And therefore, we end up with a payload that's bigger than needed. And that's why we introduce uh, the, the double layer uh, Sheik compression. And so the situation is like this. Uh, you would want to have a compression layer uh, just above the encryption barrier uh, where you can still see uh, the header of the, the structure of the headers and then encapsulate in the intermediate layers and do again compression and maybe fragmentation right at the above the link layer. And actually, if you think of it, maybe uh, the you need to do the lower uh, compression and fragmentation um, at the uh, devices and device or router that sit on the constraint link, and you can't do that right at the application server because this guy still needs IP to talk to that router. And so, if you really want, and, and the knowledge of these intermediate layers is at the endpoints of the connection, so maybe you even need three. Uh, places where you do compression if you really want to squeeze everything uh, out of that message. So going uh, to an example of compression in the stack, uh, sorry, encryption in the stack, uh, we're going to show the example with OSCOR. So just a quick recap on OSCOR. Um, OSCOR actually encrypts uh, 
co-op messages. It's tightly embedded into uh, co uh, the co-op protocol. It's not an extra protocol on the site. Um, what it does is uh, hide uh, the, the code away from um, the lower layers. It hides whatever options, whatever fields uh, can be safely hidden. Uh, and to do so, it builds a pseudo co-op header, tags the payload uh, with it, encrypts, and then keeps the rest of the options in fields that are needed for operation on the network. Uh, puts a uh, fake code for messages going up or down and puts the encrypted uh, plain text as a cipher text here and that's a fake uh, mock co-op message that's going to be sent over the network um, and so if we want to encrypt uh, sorry to compress that with chic uh, in an in the most efficient fashion, we need to compress before encryption, as I've mentioned before, and then compress again after uh, encryption. And so we're going to insert shake compression at two uh, points in this diagram, compressing the plain text before encryption and compressing the headers after uh, the cipher text has been added to this uh, outer header. And so this is how we could do that. We have a little example here, compressing the inner uh, header. So we're, uh, we're going to build a rule that matches the, the, the code, which is the actual uh, co-op message. Uh, we're expecting to fly between the endpoints. Uh, here I'm showing um, the code for the request to get going up. And here we are trying to match two of the uh, acknowledgement codes that we're expecting, which is uh, OK with content and uh, not found uh, error message. And so we're going to compress this into one bit. And then we expect the get to uh, carry a URI path of uh, equal to temperature. And so we are not sending it at all. So we, we are doing compressing this pseudo header in very few bits. And this is an example of the outer compression. We know we're expecting um, a type of uh, confirmable and code of post for the message going up, which uh, wraps the get request um, to hide it away from the network. And we're expecting on the way down an acknowledgement so we have, we have an ACK code and a sorry an ACK type and a changed code not revealing the error or success of uh, the inner message and again we're using MSB operators to reduce the size of message ID and token and uh, here to reduce the size of the a score option um, a score has one co-op option, but it carries multiple fields. So we've decided to break those fields into individual subfields and consider them as if a score was uh, another encapsulating protocol. So we break those subfields uh, into pieces so that we can build a rule to match them. Okay, as a conclusion, I think I've shown you that um, the shake compression engine is very flexible. It's compatible with complex protocols. I've given you a few examples. Uh, there is an associated cost, which is we need to have a protocol analyzer able to look into the various fields of the various uh, protocols that we want to compress the header of. Uh, it's extensible. We have uh, matching operators, we have CDA actions, but nothing prevents us from adding new ones if we need in the future for any given new protocol. Uh, the, as I've shown you, the header compression is bit oriented. We only send the number of bits that are needed. We don't align everything to bytes. Of course, Eventually, when the whole shake packet is formed, we might have to align one time to bytes if the underlying layer is byte oriented, but we, we don't stack bytes into the uh, shake header. Um, 
again, head of compression is suitable to entropic coding of rule numbers. And there's a trade-off that we can play between the number of rules. We, we could have multiple uh, rules that are very specific, uh, or we can have uh, fewer rules that uh, address a larger set of incoming packets uh, with, uh, of course, more uh, compression residue bits being transmitted to be able to differentiate between the incoming packets. But that's a trade-off an implementation can, can play uh, depending on the memory and, and uh, transmission constraint. And again, just to mention that it's a static context. Uh, we can only uh, elide uh, knowledge that we have a priori and that we have installed at both ends of the link. So uh, we're not updating that context as a result of the communication going between the compressor and the receiver. And also, uh, there's no inter or intraflow compression. The compression of each packet is totally independent of the, the other packets that we've seen just before or long before. There's no regressive model, modem, sorry, modem, model, and no um, counter compression or anything like you may have seen with uh, the previous presentation by Georgios. Anyway, thank you very much for listening and I'm turning it uh, over to Georgios now to describe fragmentation. Thank you. I will now proceed with the chic fragmentation part. Here on the right side of the slide, you can see the chic framework that is split into sublayers: the compression and the decompression on the upper part, and the fragmentation and reassembly on the bottom side. Now, in order to perform fragmentation and reassembly, in chic there is a rule ID that indicates the fragmentation message format and protocol parameters. Next, in chic framework, the fragmentation comes with three different acknowledgement modes. First, we have the no ACK mode, and in this mode, we have only unidirectional links, meaning from the end device to the gateways. Next, no ACK mode supports variable layer 2 uh, MTUs, maximum transmission unit. Finally, the reassembly check sequence, or RCS, is sent with the last fragment to validate the reassembly. Now, let's assume that we have here a large chic packet to transmit and it is fragmented into multiple of fragments of variable MTU as it can be observed. Each of the fragments come with a rule ID and the fragment compressed number or FCN which is uh, coded here in one bit. When the FCN is equal to one, it indicates the last fragment, which triggers the RCS to be sent to validate the reassembly. In other words, RCS is used to check the integrity of a reassembled chic packet. By default, the CRC32 is employed. Here we have another example, and in this case, let's assume that one fragment is lost, and thus the RCS is wrong, or, in other words, the CRC32 doesn't, does not match. Thus, the receiver rejects the message. However, it doesn't inform the transmitter. Why? Because we are in no ACK mode. Now, in this last example, in chic fragmentation, we can use more than one bit to indicate the FCN value, which allows for out-of-order fragment delivery, actually. The FCN numbering is done in a decreasing way and it starts with 2 power of n minus 2, where n is the number of bits that consist the FCN. Finally, the FCN with uh, all the bits equal to 1 indicates that this is the last fragment. To summarize, no ACK mode is a simple implementation which allows for modular MTU during a transmission. The fragment losses can be detected, however, the receiver do not send any feedback to the transmitter. Furthermore, it can lead to a um, two-packet losses if all one is lost. 
And finally, it is not efficient when the error rate in the network is very high. Next, we have the ACK ALWAYS mode. In ACK ALWAYS mode, the fragments are sent in batches or windows. Then an acknowledgement is sent back at the end of each window with a bitmap of the received fragments. As a result, the missing fragments are retransmitted before moving to the next window. Finally, in ACK ALWAYS mode, the RCS is used to perform final reassembly check. As previously mentioned, in ACK ALWAYS, we introduce the concept of windows. Indeed, in this mode, the window is encoded in one bit. Here we have the same example as before. Um, the FCN starts with its highest value and it decreases with each fragment till all bits are equal to zero, which indicates the last fragment of the window. Again, as previously mentioned, with ACK ALWAYS mode, the transmitter is expecting an acknowledgement from the receiver before going to the next window. Now, considering the same example, let's assume that one fragment is lost. The receiver will transmit an acknowledgement that will contain a bitmap, which will indicate which fragment is missing from the window 0. Then the transmitter will retransmit the missing fragment. And finally, the receiver will send an ACK with the window 0, for window 0, excuse me, with uh, a bitmap where all bits are equal to 1 this time. Next, once the transmitter received the full bitmap for the window 0, it will continue with the window 1, where the same process is applied, and the value of FCN will start again from 2 power of n minus 2, and it will be decreasing to 0. Then, as expected, the receiver sends an acknowledgement with a bitmap for the window 1 to the transmitter. Similar to no ACK mode, the last fragment, in this case of the last window as well, is encoded with all, uh, all one bit to indicate the end of the packet. Since uh, RCS is correct, the receiver sends a small message of the C, the check message, with one bit equal to one, indicating that everything is okay. Last but not least, as you might observe, in this third window, the value of the window is equal to zero again. Since in ACK always a window consists of one bit, it will be changing between zero and one. In this last example, in case the one fragment is lost, then the receiver obtains a wrong uh, CRC, and thus it sends the same message, but now the bit C is equal to zero, and followed by uh, the bitmap to indicate what it has received and what is missing. As it is straightforward, the transmitter will send again the missing fragment. Now, ACK always is a reliable mode of operation when there are losses in the network. It comes with one bit to code the windows. However, the MTU is fixed during a transmission, even though the bitmap reduces the number of a total lux, there is still one acknowledgement transmission per window. Finally, it is not efficient when the error rate is significant. The third and final fragmentation mode is the ACK on error. In ACK on error, the ACKs are only sent back for windows with missing fragments, or for last windows. Similar to the ACK ALWAYS mode, an ACK uh, in ACK on ERROR mode includes a bitmap of received fragments and reassembly check bit. Then the missing fragments are retransmitted in any order. Next, the RCS is employed to validate the, the final reassembly. Finally, ACK on ERROR supports variable MTU as well as out of order fragment delivery. In ACK on error mode, the packet is divided in windows of tiles that come with uniform sizes. The tiles are placed in the windows and they are numbered in the FCN, while the window size controls the ACK size versus the number of ACKs trade-off. Next, the receiver sends back an ACK only when a window is not completed. Finally, in this mode, it is important to keep in mind that fragments are used to transport the tiles. Now, let's assume that we have a large chic packet to transmit, 
which is divided into multiple tiles, as it can be observed here. Then the number uh, of tiles, then we number the tiles from the highest value to zero. This highest value is defined by the size of the FCN, and in this case we have the FCN of three bits, thus we go from six to zero. Since we have numbering for each tile, we can group them in windows, where each window must have a unique number, which is different from ACK always, where the window was encoded in one bit, thus it was swapped between zero and one. In this case, the window comes with unique identifiers. Here we have our first fragment with window 0 and FCN value equal to 110. In this example, a fragment is created with how many tiles we want. Indeed, each fragment header contains the first tile number, which is identified from the window and FCN values, while the rest of the tiles are straightforward to find. Next, we have another fragment. This fragment starts with window 1 and the FCN is 1. So the same process applied for all fragments. An acknowledgement is not necessary to be transmitted from the receiver since no error was detected, meaning the CRC was calculated correctly and as with ACK always mode, a small message is transmitted. Next, in this example, let's assume that there is an error on one fragment, on window 6. So the receiver, when it receives the all one, indicates the transmitter what is missing. Then the transmitter, in a non-optimized way, will retransmit the last tile of the window 6. Next, the receiver gives uh, the, no the next non-complete or full window, and more specifically, it misses all the tiles of from the window 7. Therefore, the transmitter retransmits the full window 7. Then the receiver indicates the transmitter that the window is not complete actually. Thus, the transmitter sends the missing tiles of the window 8. Finally, the RCS is correct and the message is acknowledged. And we see in this example that this process is not at all optimal. However, we can optimize because the fragments cannot partially be lost. So if some elements or tiles of the fragment are missing, then all the tiles that is, it contains are missing too. Thus, the transmitter knows that it has to retransmit the whole fragment actually, so which is the case in this example. And if the MTU changes during this exchange, for example in LoRa1, if the spreading factor is increased, then the fragment can be adapted transparently and in this example the missing tile will be sent into two fragments. To conclude, ACK on error mode comes with less feedback compared to ACK always, it allows for dynamic MTU adaptation, and finally some extra padding is necessary on fragmentation if the size is not carefully chosen.